since you're speaking to me from Zurich, maybe we should start with, uh, with the Swiss news, SNB overnight. Also, that was the most surprising uh, uh, announcement out of all of the central banks yesterday. What do you think prompted the SNB to go for another cut since they had already cut earlier in the year in March? Well, I think Switzerland is kind of an outlier. Uh, inflation is low, it's 1.4%, heading lower even in the second half of this year. And yesterday's decision by the SNB was motivated by the fact that inflation was actually revised lower over the longer term to 1%. Now, it's a, it's a different target than the European Central Bank, for instance. It doesn't need to bring inflation close to 2%, but 1% is probably too low. And uh, the second thing is that uh, this has been the, the, the case already for a long time. In Switzerland, the, the currency, the strong currency, has been a key driver of disinflation uh, so far since last year. But it then reached a threshold, the pain threshold, I think, for the economy, where the uh, Swiss National Bank didn't want uh, an even stronger front. And yesterday's uh, decision is also, I think, their own way uh, to tell us that they are concerned about uh, strong currency. Obviously, because of what's happening on the other side of the border in France, French election driving some uh, further Swiss France strength. So, this is a, you know, in a way, an easy task uh, for the Swiss national bank compared, for instance, to the Bank of England or the uh, Fed in the U.S., where inflation is higher. Yeah. But also a tricky trade-off because they don't want a, a, an even stronger currency. Yeah, yeah, and, and we'll talk about France in a moment, but let me ask you about the Bank of England as well. I thought it was pretty surprising that on, an, on, a, on a day where essentially the Bank of England didn't say much, the market read a lot into it, and especially that quote-unquote finely balanced comment is what is getting people excited because it seems to suggest that even though the majority of members didn't want to change interest rates at the meeting yesterday, they may change their mind come August. What is your view? Do you think the Bank of England are readying for a rate cut in August? Yes, absolutely. I think August, uh, the, the meeting is live. Uh, it's not only about this finely balanced comment. I think you can feel that they are desperate to cut rates, really. Uh, not only a good governor, but we have already two members out of the nine members of the MPC who voted for a cut. You just need uh, three more to vote for a cut in August for the decision to be agreed. It might be a split one, but still. And more than that, I think the uh, communication around inflation, services inflation, which has been even more sticky and higher and more volatile in the UK than elsewhere, the comments were actually dovish and encouraging that, you know, the uptick was driven by a small number of volatile components. So going forward, I think, yes, the Bank of England is in the position to, yeah. as they say, dial back a little bit of this restrictive monetary policy stance. Frederick, I don't know if you remember that speech the UK chief economist Hugh Pill gave when he was in South Africa, but he likens monetary policy decisions to Matterhorn versus, uh, sorry, to Matterhorn versus Table Mountain in the sense that central bankers have the option of keeping rates high, very flat for very longer, very restrictive, or they can raise them very quickly and cut them very quickly. My sense, and I know that you've been watching multiple central banks for many years now, is that central bankers seem to be falling into the table mountain uh, category, that they, they're keen to keep rates restrictive, and perhaps the path ahead means a slower, gradual decrease in interest rates than what the market was assuming would happen about six months ago. Absolutely agree uh, with the caveat that, you know, we uh, struggle to forecast inflation in the next months. So, you know, forecasting inflation over the next year is a different task at the moment. We have uh, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of volatility, uh, there's tourism-related uh, items, then there is insurance, there is this and that. And I think, yes, of course, they want to guide us through these stable mountains, but they are data dependent. And in the UK in particular, in the US, perhaps eventually, the labor market is another uh, driver of potential uh, easing in monetary policy, because at some point, who knows, the unemployment rate could start to rise a little bit faster. I think if that happens, then the stable mountain because it becomes a little bit steeper and you have to adjust. So they do their best, including in terms of guidance, but that's their reaction function at the moment. Yes, I would agree.
Yeah, Frederick, well, let me just turn to the major matter of European markets the last couple of weeks, and that is the widening in OAT spreads. How much of a concern is that for, for the rest of Europe? And people have started to talk about potential spillovers, uh, fragmentation risks, all of these, you know, uh, major concerns that flare up every time you see a widening in spreads. But this time, it's France, one of the largest economies. This time is different, yes, indeed, in many respects. Uh, first, I would say on the positive side, the euro area is structurally stronger, more stable. Contagion risk can be mitigated. Um, yes, there might be some spillover to Italy, but as long as Italy is growing and compliant with European rules, I don't think uh, that the ECB would need to intervene. Many other reasons why we could expect some sort of, uh, uh, you know, Stabilization, But then on the negative side, this time is different. As you said, it's France. Uh, it's the largest, most liquid market for uh, foreign investors in particular. The share of foreign investors in OAT holdings is very high. So, you know, this repricing that has been fairly orderly so far, I would say, uh, is also a reflection of uh, a higher probability of tail risks. And I will just highlight that I think there might be some complacency under some scenarios we'll see in the election. But if you get something that is like a non-workable uh, majority in, in the government or something more to the extreme, far right, far left, then this tail risk probably could lead to, to, to further widening uh, into the early part of summer. I, I would be a bit more cautious, and we are not taking any position at this stage, because things can still move very fast in one or the other direction in the next couple of weeks.